I mean, once you're in the game, you rise to it. You have to. I mean, you, you just do what has to be done. The road to bankruptcy is paved with good ideas. I think there's a lot of imposter syndrome and a lot of concern that you don't really have the abilities. Everybody has the abilities. I mean, if you have the desire, you don't need to worry about whether you got game or not. Welcome to the Squaring the Circle podcast. This is part one of the entrepreneurial tech trailblazing series featuring Bob Butler. Join us with our guest, Bob, who shares his wisdom as an experienced entrepreneur who is well-versed in the world of technology and business. In this episode, Bob covers the secret to success as an entrepreneur and discusses how even great ideas based on truly innovative technology can fail, despite seemingly having everything they need to succeed. So what sets apart entrepreneurs who do prevail despite this ultra-competitive landscape? Stay tuned, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Welcome to our latest episode of Squaring the Circle, where we will be diving into the subject of successful entrepreneurship. For the curious minds who want to know what it takes to start a technology company, how you make it successful, and once you've experienced the glory of success, what to do next. Joining me for this subject as co-host is Sasha Berger, the COO of Tisby, as well as our special guest for this episode, who we are very excited to introduce to you all today. Sasha, would you like to do the honors of introducing our guest? Hello, Lily. Yes, it would be my pleasure. It's my honor to introduce our extraordinary guest today, Bob Butler. Bob is Executive Director of Nutrition Matters Foundation, COO at Intake Health, and founding partner at Final Search. He's also the CEO and founder of Best Thinking and Thinker Books, as well as Time Matters Software, where he had a very nice exit being acquired by a global tech company. And also a founder of the Tech Starts Plus Startup Accelerator, which he ran for five years. Bob has held leadership roles in high-tech innovation across startups to global companies. And that's just business. And in his spare time, which he has a lot of obviously, he, he's been involved with the casual projects like the economic development of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And Bob is also an Ironman certified coach and commercial pilot. I also want to mention that we are proud in Tisby to have Bob as our current customer and we count him as a friend of our company. Yeah. Wow. No big deal. Bob, it's very nice to meet you and to have you thank on you. the podcast. Well, thank you. It's my real pleasure and uh, very much enjoyed working uh, with you all. And as I, I did a little research, and it's been almost uh, 14 years since we did our first project together. Wow, so that's we certainly uh, know how to get things done together. And it's a real Good. pleasure to share some of those experiences. Yes, we're very grateful to have you. Uh, shall we dive right in then? We should. To exploring this diverse career and these impactful contributions to health, technology, and community. Our questions today will hopefully shed light on the key to successful technology entrepreneurship via Bob's vast experience as an entrepreneur. It's a known fact that nine out of 10 startups are destined to fail. It's not a secret. But in the information technology startup, universe, it's more like 29 out of 30 would fail. And despite the high risks, this area of entrepreneurship was and remains one of the most attractive. And you, Bob, have managed to succeed in this project time again and again and again. We wanted to know what's your secret. I don't think you'll like the answer when I first give it, but I'll have to explain it. Um, the secret to success is don't fail. Because Truly, most people's ideas are pretty good. Almost every idea somebody brings to me is well thought out. They're highly energized in how to execute. And it's a pretty good idea. And it's rare that I see an idea that doesn't at least have the potential to be a successful uh, lifestyle company mm -hmm. and have a nice, you know, sort of eight figure exit and everybody's happy. Now, not everyone can be a unicorn and make you a billionaire. But one of the real secrets of startups is most of them have really good ideas. The problem is every startup that I've been involved in at some point in its life cycle faces an existential threat. Something goes really wrong. 
and their good idea doesn't survive that existential threat. And so that's why I say the secret to success is don't fail. And while most entrepreneurs are busy aspiring for all the success, they don't backstop for this existential threat. And so it's that failure. And I've never seen an idea that didn't have at least one existential threat. Many have two. And for some reason, mine always seemed to have three. <laughs> so, um, but I actually have never seen more than three. Um, and the, the secret is that there's decisions you make at the very beginning that can protect you against these existential threats. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite sayings is, uh, you know, the road to bankruptcy is paved with good ideas. <laughs> um, because these are really good ideas. And, and people often say to me when they pitch me a good idea, and I say, well, here's why it's not going to work. They say, well, do you have a crystal ball? I mean, how do you know? And I said, because it looked like a good idea to me 10 years ago, and it didn't work. <laughs> you know, So um, the secret is how to convert a good idea to a, something that's scalable and sustainable and, most important, uh, durable so that it can withstand the existential threat. And it doesn't necessarily help my marketing credentials to use the tagline I like to do, but my tagline is the only way to really guarantee success is to eliminate all the possibilities of failure. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the time to go through all my career, but pretty much my career has led me to become an expert in all the things that can go wrong in business, mm -hmm. largely because I tried all of them once, but also I was actually in a role to for the US government to figure out why businesses fail. In the 70s, the US Department of Commerce wanted to create jobs. So they had the idea we would become partners to entrepreneurs and we would give them a building and fill it with equipment and give them two years of operating capital. And we would give them support with the best lawyers and accountants and engineers. The only condition was the entrepreneur would have to locate their plant in an economically depressed area, a urban center, a Indian reservation, a small rural area without much economic activity. And after billions of dollars and many years, almost every one of these projects failed. And nobody could believe it. How do you fail when you're given everything? and you're competent and you have a good proven business. And so I was uh, teaching managerial economics in an executive MBA program at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. And they came and asked me to do a study on how can you fail when you're given everything. And I, through that study, I became somewhat of an expert in failure forensics. <laughs> and so it's a little bit of a doggy downer because talking to me is a lot about avoiding failure when everybody wants to talk about all their riches and success, but that's how you get there. Yeah. I think it's very valuable insight, Bob, and uh, let's not take it lightly. Like, okay. Failing sometimes is not an option guys. No. And, and, and failure as an entrepreneur is just horrible. You know, I, I really go to obviously great lengths to avoid it because yeah. You so much passion, so much work, so much cost. It really is avoidable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, most businesses fail because of specific mistakes made that are mm -hmm. avoidable. Mm -hmm. And that's why I enjoy so much working with entrepreneurs, because a lot of times I can help them, you know, get through these crises. And it's very satisfying for me. You definitely done your share coaching our team and our company, which we greatly appreciate. One of the reasons you get failure is because of really an inability to execute. Um, there, there's sort of like three chronic mistakes that are made. And one is your survival depends on one entity, a venture capitalist, a key employee, a key customer. That entity doesn't have any skin in the game. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk a lot about that in our talk today because that's really important. Sure. The, the second real part of failure is you just don't get the product right. You have a vision that doesn't match up with the 
customer or enough customers to make the business scalable and sustainable. And the third thing is just failure to execute. Mm. And this one I'll probably talk less about. It's amazing how often this one is overlooked. And one of my really powerful experiences was working with a great entrepreneur who, um, you know, went to join a couple of other people and formed one of the really great venture capital companies that exist today. And I, I really don't know if I should name drop, but his name was Scott Cooper. And Scott Cooper had an idea with two of his friends, um, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, of a different way to do venture capital. And the idea at the time, when they presented it to me, sounded dodgy. <laughs> um, it, and it was very radically different. And they applied that idea now that I think the most successful venture capital firm in the world. Mm -hmm. And what most venture capitals were doing at the time was, well, we'll pick 10 companies. We'll put money in 10 companies and we only need two to hit it big. If two become a unicorn, we make you know all our money back and meet our expectations. And they would take the position, we really don't care which two they are, just as long as we get two out of our 10. And that's how venture capital was for many years and still largely is. And Jason Horowitz's model was, no, we're going to pick somebody and we're going to make sure they execute. You can go to them with the greatest idea and the most revolutionary thing, but if you can't show them you have experience with hiring engineers and marketing people and staffing up, you know, they'll give you the money, but but that's not enough. You have to have the ability. You have to have the, the contact list. You have to have the trust of talented people. You have to know how to work with talented people. And what they brought to the program was execution. Mm -hmm. And that was what was solely missing in what I call the Silicon Valley model. And it, it's just revolutionized everything. And so many people say, why do so many Andreessen Horowitz's funded companies. And, and frankly, I make decisions on whether I'm going to use the products of new startup companies based on whether or not Edition Horowitz is funding them because I just know they're going to execute. So the way I go about it is that if the greatest and smartest people use a model and it's really working, you know, I tend to embrace it. Mm -hmm. And a big part of my success in execution has been the ability to form relationships with companies like Tisby. The ability of your company to really integrate with my teams and really just become part of the mission and understand every nuance of it, really commit to our success. We're not just another contract, really understand the customer, understand the model and find the talent we need. I mean, I've, I've never yet come up with a need that's within a short time, you couldn't find somebody who could fill that need. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> very proud to hear this. And it's very, very unusual because the way the business really works is somebody's got a team mm -hmm. and that team is kind of fixed and you hope it matches your needs. But if it doesn't, you just kind of do without. Mm. And one of the things that's distinctive about Disby is if, if I have a need, you, you find a way to fill that need. You have just this enormous worldwide network of talent mm -hmm. and your ability, do we discover we, you know, we need an illustrator? Well, you know, we're coders. I know, but I need an illustrator. <laughs> Within two weeks, there's an illustrator on the team. <laughs> I heard this is pretty good, talented illustrator from UK. We got yeah. on the team. Well, um, it even goes back to when we were doing electronic publishing, you know, we were a contender against, Amazon at one point mm -hmm. and digital rights management was a, a real challenge because Adobe really had locked up the market. They had made deals that were made our economics very difficult. And at the time, Thinkorbooks was competing with Amazon. And the key was to able to get develop digital rights management. And the TISB team says, we'll, we'll figure it out. And we put together a, a book reader with our own digital rights management. When you are thinking about execution, a big part of that is talent. And there's the talent that you're going to have on staff and are going to give stock options to and you know promise all those things to. But you will never be able to get everybody you need for a successful venture by hiring them. You have to have somebody who's plugged into a much bigger network. Um, and, and 
I've always been just amazed at the size and the flexibility and the ready access uh, that Tisby's been able to bring to you know our projects over yeah. like almost We're fourteen really years. Proud now. of our people, and usually we joke in Tisby that that if it's a technology problem, that's an easy one. I want to ask you, uh, maybe we can go back chronologically and start with the. Uh, at Ham Matters and Lexus Nexus, and ask you a few questions about that. Uh, maybe tell us about that story, right? What was the main driving factor? What was the motivation, and what was your mission? Time Matters was was a software company that I developed, and it, it has an interesting story of, of one of the things that tends to make companies successful. Many entrepreneurs kind of wake up and decide, I don't want a boss anymore. I want to be my own boss and I want to be an entrepreneur. And, you know, I used to be in electronic publishing and it, we, we have a saying, people who want to be writers never are good writers. People who have to be writers are great writers. And the difference is, you know, somebody would come to me with a book and says, you know, I want to be a famous writer and I want to go to book signings and I want to make a living and I want to, you know, wear old sweaters and sit in my book filled den and, and you know feel good about myself and then somebody would come to me and say look i hate writing but i got to tell this story well the former would never succeed and the latter would always succeed you know somebody who had a story to tell mm -hmm. becomes great authors and usually they also become alcoholics and terrible spouses because you know <laughs> they, they're doing something during the day they have to do but really don't enjoy doing but uh, the truth is entrepreneurship is, is very much the same way. Many people go into it because they really just don't want a boss and they just want control of their lives. And, um, you know, some of them do okay. I mean, they, they put together some nice lifestyle companies and they have some nice exit. There are people like that in the population of people who have been successful entrepreneurs, but they're just not very well represented. People who are really well represented in the population of successful entrepreneurs, you know, are something who just really loves something. You know, they they just really want to do it. Um, whether it's play guitar or arrange flowers or um, you know solve complex multi-dimensional problems, um, they're drawn to it. And um, that that was kind of my story with Time Matters. I had. You know, in, in the day before the Internet, it's kind of hard to offer your credentials because you, everything is not recorded. But I was very much involved in bioenergy in the 80s. You know, we were running out of energy. We thought we'd be out of fuel by petroleum by 1990. And here it is, 1980, and we're scrambling to figure out this big problem. And, of course, I was drawn to that. And I landed down on the side of bioenergy and was working very hard to develop um, renewable uh, fuels and had some success. And when Al Gore's co congressional committee had hearings to hear from the top five experts in bioenergy, I was invited to testify before Congress. So I, I offered that as some evidence that I was heavily involved in that industry at the time. And I got a couple of patents and we did some good work. And today that project keeps about 30 million metric tons of sequestered carbon out of the atmosphere every year. And every time you pull up to a gas pump and it says contains 10% ethanol, well, you can blame me for that. And, and, and you kind of wonder what that has to do with Time Matters and LexisNexis. But that was an early success and very learned a lot about entrepreneurship and government regulations and changing the world. And to this day, I'm very proud of that. Not to, It didn't make me a billionaire, but I feel like did some good work and, and um, made the world a little bit better place because of it. But mm -hmm. the interesting thing that happened is that, you know, it was a big game with big oil companies and big law firms and, you know, a lot of power people who didn't like to use bioenergy instead of mm -hmm. petroleum. And so mm -hmm. a lot of litigation ensued. And then, of course, it really caught on and everybody just wanted to use my tech and didn't want to pay for it. And so I ended up involved in a lot of litigation. And I would uh, get these bills from the lawyers that say, you know, $40,000 for services rendered. And I'd kind of say, well, could you be a little more specific? And they said, well, 
yeah, we worked on your case. A <laughs> little more specific? No, we don't do that. And so I sat down and started writing some software to track my own billings and basically told the lawyers I wanted them to track their time and tell me how many hours they worked on each one of my cases and so on. And um, out of that came this piece of software, which I called at the time practice management, um, which there was no such thing. So the whole time matter grew out of a need that I had. And it, at its peak, about 65% of all the lawyers in the United States um, couldn't practice law without my software. And it uh, did billing and scheduling and managed the court docket and all the documents. And, you know, it was just a complete, what we would call today, office management system, CRM. It just got very successful, started, you know, as a side thing and eventually grew to be very, very large. You know, I've done that whole journey, you know, uh, sort of a company in a, in a bedroom to exiting. And at the end of this journey, I find, found myself as a chief operating, a divisional chief operating officer of LexisNexis with about 400 people directly responsible um, to me. And then, you know, another 9,000 uh, impacted by the quality of our platform. I've had both the high end and the low end side, a big and small experience. I think the real reason I share that story is that when you look, talk to the really successful entrepreneurs, they all have some similar story. They didn't say, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Let me go find something to do. Uh, there was either something they were passionate about or there was a problem that landed on their doorstep that, that they were trying to solve. Wow. It just sounds like you are, are very, just a scrappy person, like that you were able to just figure it out in the moment. Do you think that is something that, like a trait that entrepreneurs need to be successful? You know, that is such a great question. I don't think there is any set characteristics that define an entrepreneur. I think that's one of the great myths. There's a there's an author, Doug Tatum. He has a book called um, No Man's Lamb. And it's very technical, a lot of research. And it main point it talks about is how to get from small funding to big funding. In that book, you realize he did a big study of entrepreneurs. And he his data shows they're all ages, all types, all genders, all talents, that there is no model entrepreneur, that every personality type who has a passion, who is hardworking, and is in a position to take some risk. Uh, meaning a supportive spouse or, you know, a good funding source, because that's critical. You have to be able to take the risk of being an entrepreneur. But the idea that there's a personality that makes you better or more likely to su succeed as an entrepreneur, there is some of that, but it's almost nothing like you think. The, mm -hmm. the characteristics that I see that are well represented in the population of entrepreneurs are characteristics like teamwork. Um, like, like really understanding how to take care of talented people, uh, really being careful to avoid risk, um, and how to stand lots of long hours. <laughs> this idea of being some kind of dynamic, dynamo, young, energetic, it, it just doesn't hold up when you really look at that. that. That's heavily promoted by various people trying to sell you stuff. Mm. But if you really study the people who have been successful entrepreneurs, it's a room of the most eclectic collection of people you ever saw. But they have one thing in common. They are all passionate about something and they all really were able to motivate and resource and lead a team of talented people. How do you manage wearing so many different hats at once? Well, I think it's one of these things that you don't even get a chance to ask yourself that question because it's all coming at you so fast, you just do it. I wouldn't worry too much about your capabilities. I mean, once you're in the game, you know, you rise to it. You have to. I mean, you, you just do what has to be done. I, I think there's a lot of, you know, imposter syndrome and a lot of concern that you, you don't really have the abilities but everybody has the abilities. I mean, if you have the desire, you don't need to worry about whether you've got game or not. I mean, you you will step up and do what needs to be done. What you do have to worry about is can you work with other people? You know, mm -hmm. can you get the trust of really talented people? Do you have certain skills about 
how to work with customers and you know how to get your product right. I mean, there, there are certainly abilities that you have to have, but they're all kind of the abilities that you figure out real quick because your survival depends on it. So as long as you're adaptable and hardworking and you're paying attention, you know, sort of these general kinds of characteristics. You know, I watch these people on YouTube all the time saying, you know, this is, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got, this is the approach. And I'm like, well, I guess, you know, they've never really been in the fight. because, <laughs> You know, you just do it. And, and almost everybody can do it. People don't fail on the little stuff. They, they fail because one or two big things landed in their lap and they just weren't prepared for it. Mm-hmm. They don't fail because, you know, they weren't clever enough to pick a good marketing tagline or, you know, they couldn't get their marketing plan to go viral. It's not the little stuff. It, mm-hmm. It's amazing how people of all backgrounds and characteristics can get in there and solve the little stuff. Thanks for watching. We hope you've learned something new. Be sure to stay tuned for part two, where we delve into the full entrepreneurial life cycle, from starting a business to securing a rewarding exit. Don't miss out on these essential insights for becoming a successful tech entrepreneur. We'll see you in part two.